Hello and welcome. I'm Virginia Stanley, joined by my colleagues. Chris Connolly here. Great to see everyone. Lainey Mays. Hi. Uh, we're the library marketing team at HarperCollins Publishers. We're so glad that you could join us tonight as we celebrate three forthcoming novels by and about strong women. Authors Lori Rader Day, Sarah McLean, and Tamron Hall are here to tell us about their upcoming publications of history, mystery, and romance. Each author will speak for a bit about their book, followed immediately by a brief Q&A. We want to get straight to it, so I'm going to hand this over to Lainey Mays, who will introduce our first speaker. Lainey? Unmute. That's okay. There you go. Nope. Chris, it will help? let me unmute. Okay. You're okay. You're unmuted. You're fine. <laughs> yeah, but it would turn off. Anyway, that was weird. Um, a mystery. Well, good leading. So we have a good mystery book for you. Um, and it's my immense pleasure to introduce Lori Rader Day um, to talk about her new book, Death at Greenway. So I'm going to give a little introduction. Lori Rader Day is the Edgar Award nominated and Anthony and Mary Higgins Clark award winning author of The Lucky One, Under a Dark Sky, The Day I Died, Little Pretty Things, and The Black Hour. She lives in Chicago where she is the co-chair of the Mystery Rears Conference, Murder and Mayhem in Chicago, in, in Chicago. and she is an adjunct lecturer at Northwestern University's MA, MFA in Poetry and Prose. And she was a 2020 national president of Sisters in Crime. And her forthcoming novel, Death at Greenway, comes out October 12th. And it's a captivating suspense novel about the nurses of World War II who came to Agatha Christie's holiday estate to care for evacuated children. And the mystery begins, which I will leave for Lori to speak about. So hi, Lori. I'm going to turn it over to you. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I love seeing the cover of my book. I love, I love the cover of my book so, so deeply. There she is. Look at, doesn't she look like an angel? But she is not. She is not an angel. I'm also not sure she's a strong woman. No, she is. But uh, she definitely gets her strength, uh, at least in the early days, by sort of creating this steely resolve all around herself to protect herself. Maybe she, maybe she lightens up by the end. You can see when you read it. Um, so Death at Greenway, I got the idea for Death at Greenway from a book by John Curran called Agatha Christie's Secret Notebooks. And maybe some of you have read that. It is simultaneously the most interesting reading for a mystery writer, just very inspiring to know how Agatha worked. Um, and, and also simultaneously the best pre-bedtime reading because you you read a little and you're like oh so inspired can't wait to get back to writing and then the next thing you know it's fallen on your face so it is fascinating uh, if you are interested in how Agatha worked the line from the book that that had me completely sit up in bed so excited it, it's like a half sentence and it starts on the top floor up a winding wooden staircase were the bathrooms still with the names of the child refugees from the Second World War taped to the cupboard shelves? And that is the half sentence that had me like, mm, I have to read that book. I'm, I, I pictured uh, bed knobs and broomsticks at Agatha Christie's summer house. That's, that was the picture in my head. And I knew I had to read that book. The problem was no one had written it. Um, and I had other books that I was writing, uh, projects that were sort of stacked before I could even think about writing this book. But I also was sort of waiting for somebody to swoop in, you know, decades later, why not? And write that book, maybe someone British, perhaps, someone with a history degree, uh, but no one did. So uh, at one point it'd be, it was sort of like that, that book I might write someday and then suddenly in an afternoon, it was my front burner project, which was uh, very scary. Uh, for this book, the reason why it was so scary is I had to do a lot of research. I am not a research person. I, I usually do a little bit of research for all my books, but they're, they're along the lines of, I'm going to write this the way that I hope it is, and then I'm going to find the right person to ask what I got wrong. 
And uh, that is the lazy person's research method. If anybody uh, needs to borrow that, feel free. Um, but one of the first things I did for research was visit Greenway, which that's a great research <laughs> excuse, right? And a write-off. Um, I went in person. To, I have a friend who lives there, and, and she drove me down to Greenway as if we were just tourists. We you know, paid the fee, and we walked around. It was uh, raining, so we just stayed in the house. And, and we looked around, hoping to find some little hint about the children who had been evacuated to the house. Um, and I had not done any research really up to this point. I just had this little half sentence. I knew it had happened. Um, we couldn't find really anything. If, and finally, there was a docent that we sort of grabbed her sleeve and said, is there anything in the house that you can show us? I'm, I'm going to write about these kids maybe. And she got me to the right person who took the key and took us upstairs and unlocked the bathroom that is next to Agatha Christie's room. And it's not open to the public uh, still. And it's just, it's sort of in, um, disarray, it's not, it's not remodeled the way the rest of the house has been, uh, not remodeled, that's not the right word, uh, preserved uh, the way the rest of the house has been preserved. But in that room, there is a cabinet with little cubbies behind the doors and they still have the names of the five girls who stayed at Agatha Christie's house. So um, to back up a little bit in case you don't know, if you don't know World War II history the way that I did not know World War II history, um, they evacuated about 3 million people out of London and major towns into the countryside um, with varying results on, on how safe the places were when they arrived. Because, uh, I mean, basically the whole place was bombed. Um, they sent 10 children to Agatha Christie's Holiday Home Greenway House. And, and that's the uh, little fact that, that had me, the 10 children. I learned quickly in my research, though, that the 10 children were all under the age of five. Now, the age of five does not interest me one little bit uh, when it comes to storytelling. Um, and I didn't want the, the children to get into any um, mystery novel trouble. That's the kind of novel I write. And, and nothing did happen to the children. As far as we know, they all survived the war and went back to their parents. They were not orphans. They were just uh, chaperoned by... Um, uh, a woman uh, that Agatha Christie references in her autobiography as a Mrs. Arbuthnot. A Mrs. Arbuthnot, no first name. Thank you, Agatha. Don't give me any leads whatsoever. She and her husband took the children down to, they rented the house and they took the children down and they had with them two hospital nurses. That is what Agatha says in her autobiography. Um, so I took her on, on face value and nothing is known about these nurses. They were real. Uh, they were probably young. That's all I really knew. And so those are the two characters that I was able to use to get into a lot of trouble. Um, one of the things I found out uh, on my first research trip, I went to a library that was nearby the house and I found that one of the children uh, and also this was in the house. There was a little little tiny hint that uh, one of the children had actually come back to visit Greenway as an adult and uh, had uh, somehow BBC gets in on the deal and they came and they filmed Doreen, one of the little girls who was grown up. And, and by this point, um, I'm not sure how old she would have been in, in 2012, but she came to visit the house when it was under construction because the house was turning over to the National Trust and the National Trust did all the preservation. They completely uh, bolstered up the house and, and made it gorgeous, but kept it in line with what it was when Agatha uh, lived there or not, she didn't live there. She spent uh, summers and Christmases there. Um, so Doreen became this, uh, this very helpful figure in my research because she had written a letter to the house and she had bullet pointed all the things that she remembered. And so that was the one piece of research I was able to do about, you know, that was that was sort of the leading document that I had. I didn't want, I wanted everything that she had remembered to be real in the story as well. I did have to venture into fiction. As I said, nothing bad happened at Greenway House during World War II. 
uh, bad things happened all over uh, the area. They were, um, you know, uh, facing a lot of bombs being dropped nearby. At one point before the children arrived, two bombs were dropped on the hill above the house. Uh, I believe two people died, um, but that is probably the closest that uh, bombs came. But they were, uh, you know, they had uh, dog fights going on all over the area because the house is very close to Dartmouth. In fact, it is a terrible place to try to get away from the bombs of war. It's uh, along the River Dart, which would later become very important to the buildup of D-Day and those operations. Um, for my research, I did a lot of Ancestry.com. I lived on Ancestry.com for about six weeks, I think, um, because I, you can look to see who was really there on a certain date um, in history. The, uh, the register uh, that was taken for the war told me who might have been there and that I knew that a butler and a uh, cook, a married couple, had been left behind by Agatha to help take care of the house and, and the group while they were there. And in I did original research, had some help, and uh, was able to actually give uh, confirmation of the names of the butler and the cook. I had definitive research that, uh, that says they were the real people, uh, which the estate did not have. John Curran did not have that. And then also the, um, the chaperones, the, the Mr. and Mrs. Arbuthnot, who had no first names. They do now. And the estate has uh, definitive proof of who they are. So uh, some of the research I've done has actually gone back to the estate. And, and now they have it for the next person who is crazy enough to take on a story like this. Um, one of the other pieces of research I did is I went back to Greenway in 2019 in person with my husband. Um, we were able to stay at Greenway this time in a little room that they don't rent out. You can actually rent out the top floor of Greenway House through the National Trust. It's one of their, their holiday rentals. Um, I think it's probably a little difficult to get a spot, so you have to uh, do it early. And I had not, of course. So um, through the generosity of Sophie Hanna, who, of course, writes the continuation of uh, the Poirot novels through the estate. Um, she, she heard my, I, she was in Chicago to do my event and uh, I told her about my story and she said, well, I'll just, I'll call Belinda and let her know. And so Belinda from the National Trust um, got us in and we stayed three glorious days um, in the house and got to, you know, we could go through the house during the day when it was open, but we could do the grounds uh, around the clock and we also were able to live there without a car the way the nurses would have. And just to see, okay, it's two miles to town. Um, they wouldn't walk that very often, right? But the grounds, we got to spend a lot of time on the 30 acres that they have, which were uh, beautiful. Um, I think we're got a little bit of time, um, but I know there might be some questions. Lainey, what do you think about uh, yeah. Well, I want to know, while you were at this house, was there anything creepy that happened? Or I would put it in my imagination, I'm sure. But um, It was a little creepy uh, because it was, the stairwell was rather dark, I have to say. And also, so the people, there were people staying upstairs in the rental, but they weren't there to be at Agatha Christie's house. They were just there to be on the English Riviera. And so they would be out, you know, all hours, and then they'd come stomping home past our door. Um, my husband and I were Agatha and Max. We were, you know, we'd have drinks on the hill, and we would eat our cheese and bread because we didn't have access to a kitchen. And we'd have our cream tea for breakfast at the cafe when it opened every morning. It was a good vacation, but <laughs> yeah. not a lot of not a lot of creepy. No. Well, maybe that's good. That's good. Um, there's a lot of people in the chat just saying how much like that sounds like a dream. They would love to help you do your research in the future. So you have a lot of people volunteering, which is nice. Excellent. Um, and I love that story about the access from Sophie Hanna. We love her. She, that's so wonderful. Um, and so I know before we got on, we were talking about that wonderful podcast episode you did with your editor a while back. And I'll, I'll put the link for everybody to check out later, but you're saying that this book really um, evolved a lot. And, and do you want to talk about that? Any? Sure. Um, so I had to write uh, a bad draft 
to discover the story and to understand the book I wanted to write. I don't know if it was bad. It just, and Emily didn't say it was bad, my editor. She's very kind and she's very helpful. And uh, she gave me some tips and, and said, well, I think it's close. You know, you just have to pull the strings a little bit tighter. And I, I thought, okay, okay, that sounds easy. But then I, when I really thought about it, I decided that I had not written the book that I, I wanted to write. Every time I told someone about this idea that I'd had for years and years in my hip pocket, right, waiting to, to see if anybody else would write it or if I was gonna get a chance, I would tell someone, Agatha Christie's house, evacuated children, World War II, and their eyes would light up. And I thought, I haven't written the book that they had in their minds, not yet. So I did, I uh, took it apart, threw away half of it uh, and built it back up from the ground up. And it was uh, satisfying, but that's what I did with my early pandemic days. That's how I got the existential dread to tamp down a little bit. I just lost myself in Greenway. Wow. And um, Jen Jumba, I hope I'm saying that right, said, Hi, is Jen. there uh, any part of your research that didn't make the book to the final, like to the final edition of the book? Oh, so much, because I don't know if you guys know about this, but historical writers have this thing where they just, they do the research, they go down the rabbit hole and they sometimes just stay there because it's so interesting and not a research person, but I, I did do the thing where I just spent so much time researching one day. I just, I just said, okay, I have to stop. I just have to write a story now and I, it's in there. I just have to write the story. Um, so, so much. Um, I don't know if there's anything I can come up with, but I, I definitely, um, in revising it the very last time, I know there were sections where I'm like, this is so interesting to me, but it's, it's really bogging down the story here. So I'm going to ditch it. <laughs> Heartbreaks. It, murdering our darlings, killing our darlings is what that's called. And it does hurt. Oh, Jenna wants to know what's your favorite Agatha Christie novel? That is a great question. Uh, so many. I really love uh, The Murder of uh, Roger Ackroyd, of course. And, and then There Were None might be uh, one of the best. I had to read a couple specific ones for this book because they, they, they were part of the research process. I read a few of the books that she wrote during this time to see what she said about war. And I read uh, Dead Men's Folly, which is a really good, a really good one if you haven't read that one. It's not as popular as some of the other ones, but I read that one twice because that is set at Greenway. It is masked by changing of names and that sort of thing, but almost everything she writes about the house and the land and the town in that book is Greenway. And so I used that to see how Agatha fictionalized Greenway and, and herself, because the character that she wrote that is based on herself uh, is in that book. So. Oh, oh that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and just a technical question that Ellen wants to know how long did the children stay in the house during the war? That is a great question. Uh, and I was unable to answer that question. I think it's, it's a year ish. It might've been shorter. Uh, they moved in. They were not immediately evacuated at the beginning of um, of war. These were little kids who were uh, taken later. Um, but they also got kicked out rather quickly because the house is uh, up on a hill over a river that feeds out very like within a couple miles to Dartmouth and the channel. So it is prime uh, overlooking the war readiness, it's a, it's a spot that was meant for sailors and, and strategians, not for uh, children. So they were, the house was requisitioned almost as soon as they got there. Oh, interesting. Well, someone wants a playlist for this book, so maybe you can work on that, but. Okay. I had one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'll get it, I'll get it up on Spotify. We'll share that with you guys on here. Um, and so just one last question before we have to wrap it up really quickly, but um, a few people want to know about is it, if it's harder writing historical or contemporary. And I think that that's interesting because I had written down to ask you, this is your first historical novel. And so um, 
So what, which one's harder and will you return to historical? Well, I mean, they're both hard. Or maybe I'm just a whiner. I'm not sure. It's not digging ditches. You know, it's it's not a, a difficult job, but it's, uh, it's sometimes difficult to get focus when the world is being a little nuts, for instance. Maybe a worldwide pandemic starts. Um, I think historical is more difficult for me because of that. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm not a historian the way that some historical writers are. They have a period that they know so well, they just start writing. You know, they don't have to research every single word the way that uh, I sort of have had to do. And they, or they know the voice that they want to use uh, to make it sound uh, at least partly authentic. I, I had to sort of work through all of those issues. And yeah, I, I think because of the research, historical is harder. Uh, I'm probably going contemporary uh, for the next book. I, I'm not really sure what the next book is, but you know, I have a couple of historical ideas up my sleeve, so we'll see. Yay, well, we're, they're all looking out for it. We're all very excited. <laughs> Um, and I think that's our time, but this has been so lovely. And thank you for- Oh, Virginia wanted me to show oh, my yes, killing sorry. it pen, my, my little knife pen. I put it on as a little pep talk for myself. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> thank you so much and congratulations on the book. And we can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Lori. And thanks for showing the pen. <laughs> Pin. All right. Next up, we have Sarah McLean. I'm going to go ahead and ask her to come on screen with us. Let's see. I'm getting out of the way. Oh, no, that's okay. Let's see. I definitely saw her. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Lots of love for the pen, which we also that playlist. I want to hear that. That's a good idea, Jen. I'm glad you wrote that. Seriously, let's see here. That's very cool. Very cool. And Sarah should be joining us here in just a moment. See. Oh, I see that Lori put the playlist um, on her, her website at, on the chat. So thank you, Lori. Here. Oh, she said, I will. <laughs> And Sarah, if you're out there, if you want to type in the chat, because I'm not seeing you in the attendees right now. Let's see here. She had written a, a, a comment, if that's easy. To oh, there, there you are. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, let's see. Sarah is officially invited on screen. And while she comes up, I'm going to introduce her. Uh, I don't know if she I'm needs here. an introduction, but I'm honored to give it. Hi, Sarah. Thank Hi. you. Um, so welcome, Sarah. Uh, um, quick introduction. Uh, you are the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of romance novels translated into more than 20 languages. If that's not enough, you're also a romance columnist, a co-host of the weekly romance podcast, Faded Mates, a lifelong romance reader, of course, and very importantly, a Library Reads Hall of Fame author. Um, so you have always been an amazing advocate for libraries and a friend of ours. Your new novel, Bombshell, is the first entry into a new series. So that's so exciting. And it is coming August 24th. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to you and let you talk about Bombshell. Yay. Thanks, Christopher. That was great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for spending your night with us. I was wrapped by Lori's story. I had no idea about any of that. And now I want to go do research too. I'm also in a house where the sun is setting into me. I'm not like in fire or whatever. <laughs> um, anyway, I am so excited to be here. Yes, I am. Um, I love doing anything with the library team at HarperCollins. Um, I love talking to all of you because Libraries are really where I got my start as a writer because they are where I got my start as a reader, as a romance reader. Um, when you are a romance reader, for those of you who don't know, you end up reading as voraciously as possible when you first discovered the genre. And um, instead of buying books, the library was there for me when I was 13 and just wanted to read every single historical romance there was. So. 
Um, I always love talking to libraries and librarians, um, but I'm gonna try and be fast because they told me to stay to time. Um, so uh, they asked me to talk a little bit about Bombshell, Bombshell, which is coming um, August 24th. And it is the first book in a new series called Hell's Bells um, about a Victorian era girl gang that kind of kicks ass and takes names, but also falls in love in the balance. Um, and I thought I would talk a little bit about how Bombshell came to be because there are really three um, kind of important things that I think, important ingredients that made the sauce of this one. The first is, of course, I, I talked about it already a little bit, but my career in romance, my lifelong love of romance novels, I still kind of pinch myself when I think of myself as a romance author, but I'm a romance reader first, which is why I do the podcast, Faded Mace, and um, why I'm so, I'm constant. if you want to talk about what I'm reading or what you should be reading, I'm here for it. We can do that all day. Um, and I think part of why I became a romance reader is because when I was 13, I was an awkward middle schooler like many, many other middle schoolers. Um, and there was something about romance that was about the heroine being strong and badass and always triumphing at the end. And that was a really compelling idea for me. And so when I came to romance as a writer, a decade ago, you all, a decade. <laughs> um, I can't even believe that. I It just sort of was a natural thing that I was gonna start writing these kind of big, bold, brazen women and these these heroines who really did kick ass and, and take names. And so um, the mclean -averse kind of became, that became a hallmark of, I think, my books. I hope you all agree. And, um, so I wrote, you know, I, I sort of started writing these series that were interconnected and I wrote a casino series that was interconnected by all of these kind of fallen aristocrats who had to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And then I wrote um, a series about these really great sisters, these five um, kind of scandalous sisters uh, and their, their um, and their life in London in in the Regency or pre-Victorian times. And then I wrote a series about smugglers um, and that was sort of very Peaky Blinders fan -fic -y for me. I just spent a lot of time watching Peaky Blinders, honestly, and then just opened a vein and wrote The Bare Knuckle Bastards. And um, while I was doing that, I thought um, I had this, the, the, the series about the sisters had a fifth sister, a kind of wild child sister who um, who readers really loved and who I had sort of intended to just give a novella at some point, like she'd eventually get a Christmas novella and it would be great. Um, and then when I started writing um, Bare Knuckle Bastards, I realized that I wanted to write a girl gang next. Um, and I wanted it to be a real like sisterhood story. And I wanted it to be about found family. And I wanted it to be about smashing the patriarchy and about just burning it all down. Um, sort of one step, oh, I, I burned some stuff down in, Daring, in, uh, in the Bare Knuckle Bastards too. But as I was writing the Bastards, I was like, I have to do this with women. And I wanna do it. And it made sense that this kind of fifth wild child sister would be the first heroine of this new series. And so I proposed it to my editor and she was really kind about it and said, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Yes, you can call it Hell's Bells. Yes, let's do it. So Bombshell happened because of that. Um, but it also happened because of history. And I loved hearing Lori's talk, Lori talking about her process because um, for me, my process is very kind of, I, I it's a similar in the sense that I something will just float past on Twitter or I'll, you know, see a sentence in a research book and I'll think like, that's the whole story for the next series. And this was the story of the 40 elephants, which is the female half, the woman side of um, the elephant and castle gang, which was the largest criminal gang in London in, in the late 1800s. Um, and elephant and castle, the 40 elephants was the women's side and they were bookies and also shoplifters. 
And they were run by the queen of the 40 elephants, whose name was Alice Diamond. She had about a million aliases, including Diamond Annie, which I think is great. And then they had uh, specialty dresses made with skirts that were sort of hugely diaphanous and they could fit, you know, fur coats inside their bustles. And um, I just became fascinated by this idea of this like girl gang, this like criminal gang. Um, and I didn't end up writing a criminal gang, but that was the kind of seed of the idea. And I ended up writing not really criminals, but kind of vigilantes who want to burn down the patriarchy. And so they do. So, I mean, maybe they do some, they do a little crime. They do some crime, but um, it's in service to a greater good. And um, as Joanna Shoup said, well, it makes sense because in every McLean novel, uh, someone gets justifiably punched in the face and that for sure happens here in Bombshell and it will happen in all the other books in the series. Um, and so, and then the third thing is this kind of the pandemic really. I mean, last year was a really rough year for so many of us and so many of you I know were, were managing, we're thinking about how to keep a community alive and how to feed a community within the restrictions of the pandemic. And I was alone in New York City in my apartment with my husband. I wasn't alone. I had a husband and a kid and a dog, but it, you know, was alone at my desk and I was longing for a community and I was longing for my friends and missing my friends. And so I really wanted to write a story about a community of people who support each other and love each other and are partners with each other. Um, and also about a love, I wanted to write a love story that was super sexy and swoony and all the things that love stories and romance novels should be, but where the hero becomes a part of a larger community. And that's, I think, what I did here. It's what I tried to do, at least, and I hope you'll all agree. So that's Bombshell. And um, I, I think Lainey, oh, Chris, hi. Yes, hi, hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sarah. There's a lot of excitement about the book and seeing who gets punched in the face justifiably so in the book. <laughs> so that's very cool. Might um, be more you, than one person, honestly. So <laughs> all the more wonderful. Um, so could you talk about the title, Bomb? So how did we how did sure. we land on that? Yeah, I mean, we it's sort of a oh really modern. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry, you, you were accidentally muted. That was my fault. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, it's a weird title for a historical, right? Because we don't think of bombshell as being a historical word, although um, it's it is it's it's historical, but it it has a real modern feel. And um, I think McLean books have a kind of really modern sensibility to them, despite being set historically. And that's because romance really isn't historical. Romance isn't the same as historical fiction. It's it's more modern. We're talking about the same kinds of things that um, contemporary romances and contemporary novels are talking about. Um, we're just setting them in this kind of lush wrapper of history. Um, but more importantly, when we sat down and we started talking about the stories themselves, the whole arc of the series, um, and it's all planned out already for books. And um, we really started thinking about the words that society weaponizes when um, we talk about women. So, uh, and these are words that relate to sexuality and sexual identity and comfort, um, but also to women's anger and um, to women's rage and to women's power. And we wanted to name all the, the four books are all titled already, but I can't share them all with you. Um, and But each one is named um, for one of these words that has been weaponized because of what I think is fear of what happens when women and other marginalized people have control of themselves, have control over their own destiny and their own future, and are able to choose happiness um, instead of tra tragedy. Um, so I'm really excited about Bombshell. I love, I mean, the art department did this gorgeous job of kind of making it historical, but also modern. Um, and it's just such, I'm, I feel always incredibly blessed to be with Harper because you all know when I say, let's try this thing, you're always like, yeah, let's try this thing. So. 
I love that. And I love the concept of, you know, confronting that weaponization, as you say, because that's really, I mean, I've listened to you talk about romance before as the genre as a whole, and it's kind of a similar thing you're doing, right? Like that's, it, it's this powerful genre that does face patriarchal right. pressure against it. So Right. And you want to talk about, you know, the, the hallmark of the romance novel is the happily ever after. And there's something incredibly subversive about telling a story and centering um, women and other people in the margins and saying, instead of putting them on the page and giving them trauma and, and, and having them, you know, suffer and die, potentially, we're going to give them happiness and hope and a partner who cares for them and, and a future that is triumphant. And there's something powerful and subversive there. So just like with all of these words, when you reclaim the word, um, it becomes powerful. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and speaking of the next three books, uh, uh, the four, can you give us any more details about some of the characters that might be appearing? Yes. Yeah, so um, in Bombshell, you will meet the four, there are many bells, but you will meet the four main bells um, who are Cecily, who's the heroine of Bombshell, um, Adelaide, and then Imogen, and then the leader of the gang whose name is the Duchess. Well, she has another name, but for now she's the Duchess. <laughs> and so, um, and so each of them will get their book. The next book is Adelaide's book, um, and then Imogen, and then the Duchess, um, because it's romance. And so your big duke has to come at the end. Um, but the so you will see more justifiable face punching, probably. Um, each one has a particular set of skills. It will surprise absolutely no one that I love. Um, I love a movie where a character just has like, you know, extra skills um, and is just lives in a kind of really extra way. <laughs> um, so Cecily is the bombshell of the of the organization. She's, you know, a femme fatale of sorts. Um, Adelaide is a little bit the Hulk. Um, she's kind of meek and wallflowery until she um, she has a wicked sense of justice, I think. And when she gets angry, she gets really, really vengeful, um, which is fun. Uh, Imogen is a brain um, and likes to blow things up. <laughs> and, uh, and the Duchess it, um, loves it when a plan comes together, for those of you who are old enough to remember um, the A-team. So... Okay, oh, and so much excitement in the comments. And I think this is a good question from Jenna Friebel. Of this gang, who do you relate to the most? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. Um, I, I mean, all of them, to a certain extent, it's kind of each one is a weird kind of archetype, but also a mishmash of women I love and um, I think here's what it is. Maybe it's less relate to. I would like to be all of them <laughs> or maybe just like be part of the gang. I've basically written a whole group of friends for myself. Um, but I'm very excited. I mean, I think you'll all love Cecily because we know Cecily. It was really fun to come back to Cecily um, and to Caleb, um, who is also from a, you will recognize from older books. Um, if you're new to Sarah McLean, though, you don't have to start, you know, you don't have to read the past, but my books are all interconnected in a sense of like, everyone's the neighbor to somebody else. So, you know, when, when I need a dressmaker, there's just one here for me. Um, but Adelaide, her just sort of, calm that then the calm she is she is a, a still waters run deep kind of person and when she gets angry it is always on behalf of what she believes is right and I feel like that is both um similar to me and also a big flaw for me <laughs> sometimes as it is for her so but she's also the one I'm writing right now so all of them Love it. Uh, and I just want to read a, a few quick comments. Uh, Donna Rasmussen says, Sarah, all caps, still looking for my own bare knuckle bastard. Can't wait to tell my romance loving patrons all about the kick butt hell's bells. Love the McLeanaverse. So uh, amazing. Yeah, just so many fans here who came and appreciate you being here. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, with this new series, I mean, do you, does your approach change? Uh, you know, you've, you've been involved in this world previously the bare knuckle bastards for so long is it weird entering this new phase this new series does, it, does your process change at all um that's a hard question to answer because i think everybody's process changed over the last 18 months but um 
I will say this, the bare knuckle bastards have not, are not going away because um, yes, the McLean universe exists and it's always interconnected. And I love being able to pull old characters through and you never know who might be the next hero or the next heroine. It might be somebody who you you met, you know, six books ago. Um, but finishing the bare knuckle bastards, and I really believe that series is done. It, it was a really tightly plotted series. I knew exactly what I wanted the end to be of that series. Um, but there's still a real feel for me of I'm I it was the first series I'd ever written and finished and felt sad that I had finished it. I I felt that it wasn't over. Um, so I can definitely see them coming back. But the the bells are really about I, I feel like this is the natural next step for me when I put when I I don't know how other romance novelists do this, but when I pitch, a, when I write a book, it's always part of a larger conceptual series. And the bells have been with me, you know, for, they've been cooking for many years. So I was ready to go. Excellent. Um, and I think we have time for one more question, if you don't mind, Sarah. This is from uh, Alice Castle. Sarah, if you could live the life of one of your characters, past and future, who would it be? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I know like I'm supposed to say Cecily because that's the book that's coming out, but um, I'm not going to, I'm gonna break the rules. And I'm gonna say Hattie from Brazen and the Beast because um, she's probably, I mean, gosh, she's so, she just understands herself and like makes this decision to live her truth and that's how she finds all her happiness, which I know we all kind of know that that's the path to our sort of happiness, but that's a really hard thing to do. And Hattie really does that. Um, and also she ends up with Wit, who's perfect, so. <laughs> it seems uh, viewers agree with that, that choice, <laughs> so that's very cool. Um, well, again, I want to thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. Uh, it's always thank you for so amazing, your energy and passion and insight. You're one of a kind. We do have a podcast episode, which I think we mentioned. We linked it in the comments, uh, talking with your editor, which is incredible. Uh, and then we have eGalleys available. So every, all you librarians watching, those are available. Do check it out. Um, and Bombshell is coming August 24th. So thank you all so coming. much for spending Tuesday night with me. That was really fun. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. We'll thank see you, you again Sarah. soon. Bye. That was wonderful. She's amazing. She's amazing. Oh my God, everybody's amazing. Everybody's hanging out and having fun. <gasps> Rounding it all out. Tamron Hall. Is Cameron Hall there? Just invited her on screen, so she should be showing up very soon. All right. Those were great questions everybody had, too, for Lori and for Sarah. <laughs> yeah, that podcast episode with her editor, who we love. We love, well, we love both of their editors, but just check that out, guys. Hello. Hello, Tamron. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm Virginia Stanley, and I'm, I don't know if you can see my colleagues, Chris Connolly and Lainey Mays. I can't. I see Chris. <laughs> I see you. Lainey. How are you, Tamron? How are you? We're fine, thank you. How are you? Thank you so much for taking time. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's, uh, it's very exciting to have you here talking with librarians um, about your new book. So uh, I'm just going to do a brief introduction, and then I'm going to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about your book, and then we'll okay. do a few questions, OK? Fantastic. Um, OK, so Tamron Hall, uh, the, the host and executive producer of the Emmy Award and Gracie Award winning daytime television show, Tamron Hall. Uh, since 2013, you've hosted Deadline, Crime with Tamron Hall, and previously were the first African-American female co-host of the Today Show and served as the anchor for MSNBC Live with Tamron Hall. Now, to add to all of that, that one and all, <laughs> congratulations you. on your debut novel as The Wicked Watch. Oh my goodness, this is so exciting. This is a brand new series with this kick-ass reporter 
Jordan Manning, who I love, and I cannot wait to um, hear more about her from you. But um, you know, there's so much there's so much that can be said here. But this is for you to talk about. But the one thing I want to say about this this character is that, and again, I'll have you talk about her. But what I love about her is that she gives voice to the voiceless. That I thought was the most, that is the most critical description of the whole thing. I think that wraps her up completely um, and defines who she is. So much to her, but giving the voice to the voiceless is I feel the core of As the Wicked Watch. I'll turn it to you and ask you what, what you want to let librarians know about this book and this series. Oh, thank you, first of all, for having me. And it's I'm, I'm actually a bit nervous, even though I spend most of my life on television since the age of 18. Um, Sarah and Lori to be part of this, Harper Collins. it's all, I, I, I'm so nervous that I went out to my garden and I pulled these flowers and I don't have them centered up properly in the shot. So that's, I'm, I'm like trying to do stagecraft here, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it is, it's been fascinating. I'm here in my home and this time last year, I was writing this novel and it was something that while taping the show during a pandemic in this same room and then going upstairs to the room right above and writing this novel as the Wicked Watch was such a fascinating journey for me. I'm 50 years old. I have a toddler who's two years old. And I thought that would be the biggest challenge of my life. The novel proved to be even more difficult than having a baby as old as I am because it unearthed so many feelings and emotions. Um, I realized that while writing this novel as uh, Dorothy Gale and The Wizard of Oz, it was always in me and it was time for me to express it. The book uh, was inspired by two stories that I'd covered as a reporter, one in Dallas, Fort Worth, where I cut my teeth at the beginning of my career, and another in Chicago, a year apart. Both um, cases involved the um, murder of 11, two girls who were just 11 years old. And the first case was, I believe the last big story that I covered as a young reporter, uh, four years in Dallas, Fort Worth, and the pain that I experienced that day as a journalist, I, I wanted to capture, ca I wanted to bring a character to these pages that similarly experienced what I did as a real reporter, but somehow processed it differently and was able to present it to the reader where I could not always present those feelings to people watching at home. A year later, I ended up in Chicago, obviously a great news town, and got the assignment of covering another 11-year-old girl who was murdered. Um, their lives could not have been more different. Their stories could not have been more different. But yet there I was, the reporter, covering both of them. And again, not being able to express what that feels like. So going back to this time last year, in my home upstairs, this person, Jordan Manning, emerged from my heart, from my soul, from my spirit. And she is, I believe, a voice for the voiceless, but she also in many ways became my voice or the voice I wish I had at the time when I covered these stories, the complexities of it, the failures by adults who in some cases ended up convicted and others who likely experienced a conviction of the heart because of actions that they could have changed or could have done in a different way. So those were the inspirations. And, and I feel odd even saying that, you know, yeah. how are you inspired by the death of a child, right? You know, as my own child is upstairs right now with his dad putting him in bed, you know, that's such a, a feeling of conflict for me. And then um, it also gave me an opportunity to look at a crime from the perspective of the family. I've been very open about the death of my sister um, a victim of domestic violence. I was very conflicted for many, many years to talk about it because I did not want to be seen as, oh, here comes a celebrity with a sad story or, okay, here's the celebrity, it's time to promote something, so let's pull up something that's horrible that happened to her. Um, but it was an article 
that um, some years later came and it said something around the fact of, you know, Tamron's whole sister who was murdered. And I said, my sister has a name and her name is Renata and she was awesome and she was cool. And, you know, I mean, if when people say that I, I, I have great style, I, I think about you should have seen my sister. I was truly the ugly duckling in the room uh, when she was around. And um, I struggled with how to represent our family when sharing her story. So um, I say all of that to say, this book um, was therapy in the middle of a pandemic, but this character always lived in me. And this novel always lived in me. And this was the opportunity to share it. So we follow Jordan Manning, a forensic scientist turned reporter. And it is a little bit of, you know, um, as I, I joke with my friends, I said, if, if, if uh, Carrie Bradshaw and Angela Bassett had a baby. This is Jordan Manning. You know, she loves her life. She loves dating. She she loves all of the layers of having good friends. But work ultimately is her true love. And when this case pulls her in, she is unwilling to let go. And we follow that. And this is a series. And I've already started. You know, working on the sex part. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was a, it was a whirlwind experience having lived my life in television and now having this opportunity to share this story with uh, the audience. So it's it's been a lot of things. I know that was a long answer, but I'm a writer now. Ah, I can't believe yes, it. you are. <laughs> and congratulations, and that is so thrilling. You have such support. Wait till you see the, the, the comments here. Uh, <laughs> people are just so excited saying, don't be nervous. Lynette, <laughs> librarians innately love authors and they love you. And they're so excited for you. This is a this is really such a wonderful opportunity for us to learn from you. And the backstory of this is uh, it really fills fleshes it out for us. You know, I mean, I think that this character um, you know, she is one of the few women of color in in the uh, in the newsroom, and so, and that sort of she has her frustrations, uh, right? And she's um, and so and it is reflected. You you know you go through that in the book. Um, uh, one of the questions uh, wa uh, somebody wants, let's see, Donna Rasmussen wants to know. I love the title as the Wicked Watch, and I think the title alone would get me to want to read it. How did you come up with that title, Tamron? Oh, Donna, it was honestly in the middle of the night, I, I was talking with the team and it was something that I, I don't, I, maybe I was watching one of the Netflix series. I'm not sure, but obviously she lives her life on television. And so often, especially in crime, the wicked are watching. They are watching to see how it's covered. They revel in it. They watch to cover tracks. And sometimes the wicked are watching and we don't know that they're the quote unquote bad people. Um, they don't even know that in many cases they are the bad people. That could be a law enforcement or an attorney. They think that they are in there doing what is right. And, and in many cases, particularly in the story out of Chicago, it was great wrong at the hands of people who were supposed to protect. Hmm. Yeah. That is uh foreboding. Um, uh, this was a question I was going to ask you, although you sort of answered it uh, when you were talking before, but uh, Jenna Friebel wants to know, what made you choose Chicago as your setting? And did you consider other places or did you know from the start that Chicago was the place for it? But but Jordan started in, in Texas, yeah. right? And then when she comes yeah. to Chicago, she's she thinks she's seen it all till she comes to yeah. Chicago, right? Right. Yeah. And that was, again, inspired by things that I had experienced. Listen, Chicago is a great American city. I lived there for 10 years. And if the summers weren't 30 below, I'd probably still be there. It was a <laughs> phenomenal city. But what we know and recognize more than ever before, the complexities of law enforcement in Chicago and whose story rises to the top. As I said, I've been in television since I was 18. I'm now 50. Um, in the intimate conversations in newsrooms, um, which Jordan explores, are often um, about whose story rises to the top. Is a white blonde child's disappearance mm. more important than a child of color? And those are questions that are asked in the newsroom. And I'm sure we ask ourselves that when we watch the news, a child missing, missing, aren't all children important? Why is you know, a certain story uh, like a John Benet Ramsey, which I covered and recently spoke with her father about how the media handled that story. Um, they were wealthy. Did they get a more, you know, just uh, 
rigid eye from the press or, or more um, suspicious eye from the press because of their wealth. All of these things layered in, but Chicago, I felt was the perfect setting, A, because I love Chicago and the story of Ryan Harris, which was the inspiration for parts of this case. Um, I felt rang more authentic and um, the next case uh, is in a different city, but it makes sense in locale, uh, in location and proximity to Chicago for Jordan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love that you, you, what you're saying is that, you know, these, that the coverage just isn't there as it is for, as you say, these, you know, these, any murder is horrific, but it's, it's, it's more horrific that there isn't even coverage, so. Yeah. And why? And and honestly, right. why? And do these conversations happen in newsrooms? And Jordan's life as a journalist gives us that perspective. You know, she gives us a glimpse of this huge newsroom in this great American city. But what is really happening intimately and how the decisions are made on what is your lead story and mm -hmm. who gets to cover that lead story? Mm -hmm. What does the, I remember starting this business and the definition of the A1 reporter, that was the lead reporter. And they seem to all look the same for a very long time. Yes, yes. Uh, this is an important book. This is just such a thrilling new series. Um, and uh, I, 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 there's so many fans here. <laughs> um, okay, how do I pick the, let's see. Um, Okay, so we got to Chicago. Oh, how did you come up with the name Jordan Manning? And and do you see parts of yourself in Jordan? I bet you're going to say yes. Yeah, I do <laughs> see parts of myself in Jordan. And okay, here's the confession. Michael Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> and Peyton Manning, which I'm not sure why. Oh, my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> so, I don't know. And I don't even know what team Peyton Manning plays for, but it came in my head. And I thought it sounded like a great, strong name. Um, I felt I, I always wanted my name to be Tony growing up because I thought Tony, first of all, Captain and Tennille, Tony and Tennille showed my age. But it was a, you know, a gender you know, name where you didn't know the gender of the person. Right. And I wanted her uh, to uh, her name to make people curious. And I thought Jordan was a name that instantly makes you curious. Where is she from? Where did her parents come up with that name? Where, you know, is, is Jordan Manning a guy? Who is that? And, and I felt there was a name that um, inspired curiosity it does it does and it's it's like well do and I now you know that? it's an athlete two athletes combined <laughs> and they're both tennis players or something i was up then <laughs> <laughs> um uh let's see uh okay oh my goodness so many questions so little time let's see uh l gail mitchell tamarin since there will be more books do you want each book to stand on its own or are you trying to build a body of work with connections between each book it's a good question you know that is a great question and um i always tell my my team i know what i know and i don't know what i don't know and i don't know a lot um the book right now the second in this series they are tied to jordan still living in chicago still being a reporter in chicago but she is pulled to a neighboring state because of a case. And I, as I see her growth, I do see her being pulled, of course, up to New York or LA. You know, that is where reporters, you know, many, one in this room right now, looked at as the beacon, you know, is that where you go to make a difference? Or is it all an illusion? You know, is that a bill of goods that you're being sold? Can you make a difference? Can you speak for the voiceless? if you don't make it to New York in the national news. So she's faced with those questions. Where is she most impactful? Where can she best inspire change? Where is her power? And 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 with this character, she recognizes that power is not, you know, being able to get a great restaurant reservation. Power to her is the ability to give families and mm -hmm. victims peace and give them um her power, if you will, you know, me, my husband and I, we, we are, I'm going to tell you my Wi-Fi code. So if you're ever in my area, you're going to take my Wi-Fi. We call ourselves Wonder Twins. I watched this, you know, Wonder Twins power activate, form of, you know, and for Jordan, it's like Wonder Twins activate. I'm activating my power to help other people. But am I more powerful with New York or LA? Or again, is that something you think you want, Jordan, but it really isn't? What comes with that? That's very interesting. So the story will, the story will dictate 
Yeah. The location, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you're, um, you've got tw well, over 20 years of journalism experience and, um, and years spent reporting on crime and tragedies across the country. And you've talked a little bit about it, but could you talk a little bit more about how that informed your writing of this book? You know, it is, um, it, it is a unique perspective of life that some days I wish I did not have. Um, and I know that sounds, uh, that's, that's probably a lot of therapy that I need and maybe a little more wine with all of us here. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember Virginia, uh, oof, I, it had to be 96, 95. I was an overnight reporter. And that means I was in at 4 a.m. Much of my career, I've gone in at 4 a.m., whether it's the Today Show, even the show I have now. 4 a.m. with my lone cameraman, and we were often assigned to fires or gang shootings late night, because that's what happens sadly late at night, and that's what ends up mm. on your news when you're watching in the morning. And we got a call that a, a salon owner had been murdered, and he was gone in to get his towels uh, to take them for laundry for the next day of business. And we got there almost immediately, me and the camera person. And um, we got there, and... Uh, the man's body was still there. I'd never seen a body before. And I'm gonna get misty eyed here because it's, mm. it's still very difficult. Um, we got there and before I could realize or process what I was seeing, there was his body and I, I watched him. He was dead, but you know, his body, you know, it wasn't like the corpse and you see it on Columbo in the in the in the morgue. This was on the scene. And his wife drove up. Oh, I'll never forget it. She leaped out of the car and the song of all songs, um, Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart was playing oh. on her radio. Her door was open and she ran out and she looked at me and she said, the hell, what and, and I didn't have an answer. Me and my camera guy were kind of backing up and it's just a surreal experience. And those are the things that uh, formed my um uh, view of this character and what she could explore and tell that I couldn't tell. These are all things I experienced. And as I said at the beginning of that long explanation, um, things I some days wish I didn't see, but mm. it gave me the perspective that this is not a, I, I struggle sometimes when, you know, a lot of the crime shows, I call them glam crime, because it is so easy to forget there is a victim and there is a person and there's a family. And they're not, I don't use the word, I stopped using many years ago, the, the word death toll. I said, that's not a toll, that's a person. Mm -hmm. that's a nut. And, I, and so I stopped personally, no, no editor told me to do that or you know, no producer, I said, I, I cannot say that. It doesn't rest well with my soul. And so that all goes into uh, this journey of the book. But you know, also, again, I can't stress enough, because she is a human and she is trying to figure her way out and mm -hmm. dating and life, I, I wanted those layers too, because that's what reporters, you know, ultimately, and journalists, they still go home. We still go home to family and friends. And, you know, we still go to the beauty salon and everyone says, what happened with that story? What is it? And you don't want to talk. It's the last thing you're like, I just want my bangs trimmed. I don't want to have this conversation, <laughs> but people want to talk to you about it. And, and that all helped shape uh, shape for me this character and what I was able to bring from those experiences to the pages of this novel. Yeah, I think, you know, I think that everything that you bring with you, it just feels like it's coming out. Um, there's a there's a depth and an experience. And look, you just, you know, we're starting to relive that moment when you saw that 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 man passed away on the, on the, on the floor and then in runs his wife. And you remember that song. I mean, you know, you, that's something that you can't, um, you, you, you've walked it, you've been in the shoes. And so you can put it down and, and put it on the pages. And it, that's what resonates with readers, you know, but respectfully. So, you know, the fact that you're saying death toll, I don't think so. That's that you know, there's a human, um, heart, uh, on the pages and in you. And so I just think that this is such a, a really great um, opportunity to bring your experiences um, in this fictional character, but certainly with the, the heart and the guts 
of a person who has walked the walk. Um, and I, I, you know, we could go on with the questions. If can I ask you a few more? Is that okay? Yes, of course. The hydrangeas are still doing. I was okay. going to say I didn't go through all this for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> People are loving your hydrangeas, by the way. <laughs> They're from my actual garden. That's two things I did last year. I started, I put this garden to get with some help. Let me know. I, I had help for sure. And uh, and then um, the, the novel. So, yes, they're all, I'm all off center just in an attempt to get my hydrangeas some TV time. Here. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to get their own show. Right. At the expense of being centered, my hydrangeas, which I ran out of cut just before we started. You are so funny and they, they're so beautiful. They're just a beautiful Thank color. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so uh, Jen Jumba says, Tamron, you're using your power to make a difference and thank you. Um, it, Elizabeth says, they're gorgeous. My mother loved them. Uh, <laughs> Sandy, <laughs> Sandy Graham says, in your professional journey, what spot made you feel most empowered to make a difference? I, I'm not entirely sure what, but what? No, what, I think you meant in the different the different jobs, like the Today Reporter. Oh, the okay. Daytime show. That's what I. Think. Um, I think the daytime talk show. Um, because I'm able to cover and talk to people that I I want to talk to, and I'm able to bring up conversations that I couldn't in in a previous form because of the Today Show. And I'm, I'm saying because a lot with a lot of libra librarians are probably all cringing. I'm so sorry, but <laughs> because they're like, or, yeah. Um, but um. You know, before you have an editor, you have you work for. I, I still have a partner with ABC Disney, but they um, they have through our partnership recognized that I have a perspective, I have a level of experience that the audience, thank goodness, now entering our third season uh, has received. So for me, I think the daytime talk show, uh, but. You know, I give a lot of speeches around the country when I was off air between when I was let go at the Today Show and started my new gig. I gave a lot of speeches around the country from a wide range of organizations, big, small, diverse, some were all black, some were all white, some were not Latino, some Christian, some not. It. Just a big group of people who I was, I'm so fortunate um, in, in that they invited me to speak and talk about domestic violence awareness and talk about the many complexities of that conversation and how we can do more and what is more. And, and so I, I, I really, in that time, I've worked since I was 14. It was the first time in my life that I was unemployed, but mm -hmm. yet I felt my most powerful, right? It's, it, when, when it relates to what is, you know, I have a book called A Path of Light that I got years ago when I was 18. It's not even available anymore. But one of the things it said is, who are you if there's nothing beneath your business card? If you're just Tamron. If you're just Cameron Hall and there's no title, there's no company, it's just that, who are you? And during that time, I had to face that question. You know, I was once Cameron, cashier toys are up, you know, and it's evolved into many things. But at that time, I really, I was just Cameron Hall. And I was speaking um, about what I'd experienced uh, with my sister's death and, and, and all of uh, all of the layers involved in that. So I think that would, now that you asked that question, I think that that was when I felt most powerful. Maybe I didn't even realize it until you asked me that. Mm. Wow. So that's interesting how that just sort of, you know. Yeah, you unpack it, right? Yeah. Yep. It right yeah. 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 Um, well, Tamron Hall, your business card says many things. <laughs> well, in a minute, it's going to say mama and burger griller because I'm headed out changing from this, which I'm happy didn't bust open and scare anybody. And I'm going to go up <laughs> and I have corn soaking in salt because I just Ooh. read on Epicurious that that's the way to do that. I'm going to grill nice. burgers and uh, some herb butter potatoes. Wow. Come, come over. That's, that, come on over. <laughs> that is the title after this. <laughs> Jordan Manning grills. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today. Uh, this is really so exciting. As the Wicked Watch, the first Jordan Manning novel goes on sale October 26th and everyone here watching and everyone at Harper, your fans are so excited for this book. It's, it's a delicious, terrific, important, compelling read. And uh, you will be hearing a lot more about this book in the coming months. Tamron Hall, thank you so much. And congratulations. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Oh, how great was this? Wasn't this fun?
Oh my goodness, you guys, come back, come back. <laughs> Yay, we did it. Wasn't she um, cool? She's amazing. She's oh amazing. I mean, that's so exciting, you know, to have like a whole new series and she's got all this history and all this experience. All these authors are, these, these authors were wonderful, weren't they? Strong women writing strong women, mystery, mm -hmm. mystery, romance, and all that and everything else. It's just, we're so lucky. Librarians, we're so lucky that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. We'll just, oh, I know what we should say. We should say that um, next Tuesday on Facebook Live, we're going to have Anthony Horowitz. Auga. So you guys should <laughs> check it out. Go to Facebook, Library Love Fest Facebook Live. If you don't know about um, our show, Door to Door, from our door to door, your door, bring you authors and um, and lots of fun stuff. And so on, um, yeah, on uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, July 8th at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, Anthony Horowitz will be there with us. And uh, we're, we're going to have a lot of fun. And then July 13th, we're doing a, a world famous book buzz part four. Chris, Lainey, you want to talk about that? Yeah, we back for part four. We're going to be uh, talking about our upcoming titles. It's on Crowdcast. So just like you're viewing this, but the link, um, which is coming momentarily, um, you can sign up and get notifications. So that's on the 13th. 18th of July, 1 to 3 p.m. Um, I, you know, we'll have some shenanigans, I'm sure. And uh, Wanda M. Morris, author of All Her Little Secrets, our lead read, will be our featured speaker. I don't think that was a, a surprise anymore. I think everybody knows. So um, if not surprised, um, she's coming. Um, anything else? I'll get the link in there for you guys to sign up. Yeah, we got a lot of cool stuff coming up on Door to Door. We have we have um, Ann Patchett and Elizabeth McCracken. Woohoo! That's in September. So just keep watching Library Love Fest. We'll be telling you all about it. Don Winslow. We have a lot. We have a lot. Don Winslow's July 22nd. Mark your calendars. Anyway, listen, ALA, I guess, is over. Maybe there's some more meetings tomorrow, but I believe that we're done. We've packed up our booth. We've gotten out the strapping tape. We've slapped on the labels. We've sent everything home. That's not true. We never left our bedrooms. But you are in our hearts and we in yours. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for, for coming to this. This was a lot of fun. Any last minute shenanigans we want to say or do? I don't know. Donna Rasmussen says, shenanigans, count me in. <laughs> yeah, if anyone want, missed this that you know and wants to see it, the replay will be available right after this. So, I, you yeah. know. It was an amazing hour and change. So really appreciate everyone being here. Yeah. And the e-galley is for librarians. So you know who you are. All right, everyone. It's quarter after eight. Not bad for us. <laughs> and uh, we'll hope to see you again really soon. Take good care of yourselves, okay? And um, thanks again. Bye. Bye. Bye.